Iguodala to Curry, back to Iguodala, up for the layup, oh, blocked by James! It's over, it's over! Cleveland is a city of champions once again! The Cavaliers are NBA champions! That sound means it's time for Cavs on the Break NBA podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm your host, Chase Smith, and with me, he's the editor and writer at 48minutes.com. He's a writer at outkick.com. He is our Cavs insider, national NBA writer, Sam Amico. Sam, what a start for the young Cleveland Cavaliers. It's a pretty surprising start. Uh, seems like everything was, uh, everybody was playing up to their ability or even beyond what some people were expecting. So that's nice to see right out of the gate. The Cavs starts the, start the season three and one with victories over the Charlotte Hornets, a two overtime thriller against the Pistons, a blowout win over the 76ers. They lost tonight to the Knicks. Um, we're not going to lament too much over their home loss to the Knicks tonight, right? I mean, we're not going to just like overreact to that loss. Is that fair? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's necessary. I, they, they didn't play. Uh, they didn't look like a team that was falling apart by any stretch. Right. Ran into a, a pretty – stereotypical Tom Thibodeau team. It looked like that was just <laughs> scrappy and just everything was earned. Right. Yeah, that was it. It was ugly. Yeah. Uh, just like Thibodeau loves it. Um, the Cavs struggled to shoot the basketball for the first time all year. Um, and you're going to have those games. You're going to have clunkers where the ball just won't go in. Darius Garland said that after the game, that was a problem. We just couldn't make shots. Yeah. Uh, and the Knicks did have something to do with that because they're scrappy. They they grab and they claw and they fight and they I, I don't want to say they bite, but they kind of play that type of game. And uh, I mean, we saw J.B. Bickerstaff, mild mannered J.B. Bickerstaff, got a technical foul. A um, few times he was yelling at the ref so much that his mask came sliding off his face, which is you know he's a very mild mannered guy. But the the Knicks, Tom Thibodeau teams. Um, kind of force you, force the officials to call a foul on every possession. It's like, go ahead, call it. You're going right. to slow to a crawl. So they've got to let some things go. And um, it was a good lesson, good lesson for the Cavs, um, that kind of game, ugly game where they weren't making shots and it was physical and all that. So uh, those are the kind of lessons they're going to learn this year. Yeah, I think, and, th- and this will be the last really kind of point we talk about this next game because there's so many other positives to talk about Sam, but it didn't seem we had an answer for Julius Randall. No. Well, that, you know, it was a problem. Right. Yeah. And he's having a great season so far. Great start. Um, He may be the kind of player that's going to shine under Tom Thibodeau, a veteran guy who uh, is kind of, you know, getting a last chance saloon here to, to make something uh, uh, big of his career. And uh, he's been off to a great start. He finished with a triple-double. He almost had a quadruple-double because he had uh, nine turnovers, too. But the one thing I will like about the Cavs or say about the Cavs that you have to like in this game is, to me, the big difference that I saw between this year and, say, the middle of last season uh, was they really kept fighting and clawing and and, uh, trying to get after it as much as they could defensively even when the shots weren't falling, they weren't hanging their heads like young guys can do when they're missing shots. They weren't, you know, pouting. Uh, they, they, they were, they were still hustling. And I, I thought it was a real testament, even in this loss um, that, that they kept playing hard and, and, and fought all the way to the end. So, you know, yeah, it stinks to lose. You're not going to go 72 and zero, and you're going to lose some, you're going to have some clunkers. You know, some teams have, 25 30 clunkers you you hope to keep it 10 or under and and they had one tonight and that's just going to happen throughout the course of a long regular season but what did you see after the game you saw colin sexton darius garland isaac okoro stick around and get shots up after the game they knew that they were just mission shots you said they talked about it in post game i don't remember that happening last year maybe it did it just didn't get publicized but that's what you want to see out of these young young guys team you want to see them putting the shots up put the hours in and and right after the buzzer say, Hey, like we're going to, even if it's, even if it's just like a public, like stunt, which I don't think it was, but it was very visible. Like that's what you want to see. Yeah. Well, you know, most basketball players at any level will tell you 
um, the best time to get up shots and, 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 uh, and start to get your rhythm back is right after games because you've already been out there running around and shooting. Um, and it does it for, for whatever reason, mentally and physically, it, it seems like guys, you know, you hear a lot about it. Oh, it's a publicity stunt, blah, blah, blah. I don't think it is. I think it's right. I, really guys going out. Yeah. They're going to get publicity, you know, but they're, they're truly going out to try to get back into that rhythm, get up some extra shots and feel good. Um, and, and basketball players have been doing that for, for ages. I mean, since the NBA tipped off, guys would go out after games uh, and get up shots because it's just a way to kind of kind of get back into your flow and feel good about yourself heading into the next uh, practice or game. And, and you talked about just a few moments ago how this team is different than last year. Last year they started one and two under B-line. Uh, this year we're three and one. Sam, how is this team different? Let's just get it out there. How is this team different? They're more. Well, first of all, they're more connected. Um, I, I, I think that they're they're more uh, just in terms of uh, the way they move the ball and the way they play together. They're, you know, the first three games they were averaging thirty one point three assists. Number which one is in the a- league. Number one in the league. Right. So they were just more connected in that sense. Um, this year they obviously have Andre Drummond full time, uh, blocked six shots against the Knicks, you know, forget the 17 points and 17 rebounds. He swatted Dre drum in a contract year. (laughs) Yes, that's exactly what it is. Uh, I, I, I thought that too, but, um, he's just, he's, you know, look, he, he wasn't in a contract year last year. He, you know, he was in the option year, but he, he still led the league in rebounding. He's good. He's a rebounder. Uh, he's going to get you 17 to 22, 24 points a game. Uh, he is, it, it, you know, for the first time in who knows how long, the Cavs have a, not only a true rim protector in Drummond, but also one JaVel McGee, who's been fantastic off the bench. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's that's a big difference. But I think more than anything, it's just uh, – and we talked about this last week on the podcast. I, I think it's the coaching. I think it's J.B. Bickerstaff is a, is a great fit for this team and these personalities on this team. And um, I just think that they are playing hard for him because they believe in him. Uh, and they see what J.B. Bickerstaff institutes is going to work if they execute it. So – um, I, I think that there's a lot to that in, in terms of, you know, the players and the coaches all being on the same page and then the players all being on the same page when they're out on the floor together. You know, what I'm noticing from this year and last year is that the team seems to have an identity um, yeah. and that they, they know what to do with the ball, that everyone has a role and, and those roles are, are pretty clear. Um, we, the Cavs didn't get a lot of, you know, when, when COVID kind of wrecked the NBA season, the Cavs are, and a handful of other teams were on the short end of the stick. They didn't get to play those extra games. They, you know, had that time, you know, where they just didn't get to play, but they, they were able to have little mini camps. And it seems that from the very jump, Coach Bickerstaff knew what he was going to ha- what kind of offense he was going to have. And it does seem that ha- they have gelled through that time. And I think that's clear from the, from the start of the game, from the start of the season, um, that, Somehow Colin Sexton and Darius Garland have tapped into something that seems to really work, Sam. Yeah, right. And, you know, and there's a lot to that. Darius Garland looks already uh, improved, you know, just since the end of last season yeah. or, and, and, and uh, seems so much more comfortable out there, seems so much more comfortable playing next to Sexton. Sexton is, is every bit as good as he was at the end of last season. And the one thing I've liked so far obviously only four games. And, and, and I think this hurt him a little bit was Chetty Osman has been playing so well off the bench, even when, even when, you know, they needed to fill in for a coro, they started Nance at small forward. So Chetty could come off the bench because he's been playing so well against other teams reserves. Some guys are just better against some guys spend their entire NBA career kind of hovering between inability starter and top bench guy and Chetty is there now he looks to me like this guy's going to be really good off the bench I don't know that he's a starter I don't know that he should be playing against opposing starting small forwards but you bring him off the bench and put him against other teams reserves and he shines so um 
I think that maybe hurt them a little against the Knicks because Okoro and Love were both out. So Chetty had to start um, and, and and he didn't have a good game. I think he was two of 12 or whatever from the field. So um, yep, two of 12. And, uh, he led the team in minus 14. Chetty did? Yeah. 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 And Larry Nance has been another guy who, to me, is ready to start whether you start him at power forward, you know, he's going to fill in for Kevin Love with the injury, or if you start him at small forward sometimes, to me, he looks like a guy who needs to be out there uh, with the starting five because he's just been uh, fantastic in the starting line, better in the starting lineup than he has been off the bench. So, um, you know, all of that said, I think everybody, like you said, is finding their comfort in their role. Uh, and, you know, if you can stay relatively healthy, and people can continue in their own roles without having to fill in for injured people. Um, I, I think this Cavs team is going to surprise. Larry Nance led the team tonight against the Knicks in minutes, 42 minutes. Um, it, it's hard not to look at, at, at the box score and say, where does Kevin Love fit? It's hard to not look at the box score and say, where does Michael Porter Jr. fit? Right? Are you concerned that um, the, those players, well, Michael Porter Jr. especially, aren't on the court for whatever chemistry is being built right now? No, um, love a little bit um, because I'm wondering, I wondered and I wrote this column before the season, how much he still fits. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think he's a great fit anymore for a number of reasons. This team has got a lot younger, a lot more athletic. Um, and, and Kevin, you know, he's not ready for the rocking chair in terms of basketball years, but he's getting close. Mm. Uh, especially, I mean, we talk a lot about Kevin's injuries, which, you know, there is a lot. But at the same time, Chase, we have to remember this is a guy who spent, you know, 12 years, a dozen years, just banging bodies underneath the basket to get rebounds. Uh, his, his, it, it's just taken a toll on his body. It's not like he's playing 20 games a year and doing this banging bodies underneath with the likes of, you know, when Drummond was on the Pistons or, you know, some of these other big centers throughout you know, loves, loves career, but he's been doing it for 80 games. And then he did it in the finals and, you know, playoff runs and all that. It, it takes a toll on you. So yeah. when I say that maybe Kevin Love isn't a fit anymore, it's not a criticism on him. It's just the reality of the situation. The guy is, you know, sacrificed his body for a dozen years and it's, he was already fairly injury prone because of that. And now you know, he's 32. I just don't, I just don't know how much he's going to fit anymore. And I don't think it's very well, but I also don't know that they, that they can find the right trade for him either. So um, in that sense, he's not going to hurt him. You know, Kevin Love's not going to hurt the Cavs if he plays. He's just, he's just probably just not, you know, he's kind of a square peg now. Um, and Kevin Porter Jr. is uh I don't, you don't have any worries about him. Once he comes back, he'll be fine. They just minutes does he take? Well, he probably, you know, you probably won't see so much of, of uh, Exum and Dotson. Not that Dotson played a lot uh, against the Knicks, but you're probably not going to see him. Uh, and I know Exum plays the point and, and kind of backs up Garland. Uh, um, but I think that they, you know, they're going to figure it out, but you got to, you got to get, Kevin Porter Jr. on the court um, it, it, because he just he showed some flashes of brilliance last year. You're not going to just forget about the guy. So uh, I, I, I'm sure they'll find some time for him, whether it's a small forward even, you know, or if they go a three guard lineup, or they move Sexton to point at times with with KPJ out there. They'll they'll find some time from him. But uh, yeah, it's gonna. It's, other guys are going to suffer. You know, other guys, whether it's Exum or or when Stelly comes back, if he's, you know, getting his minutes taken away. So um, I, I, I don't worry about Kevin Porter Jr. fitting in. I just I love, I, I have much greater concern. Uh, so Coach Bickerstaff definitely has this team playing really, really well. Um, a lot of Kevin Love unknowns, and I think I said Michael Porter Jr. earlier. Right? Kevin Porter Jr. You uh, did. But you know what? <laughs> It's an easy mistake to make. <laughs> the, those question marks aside, the Cavs are playing inspired. They're playing well. They're fun to watch. That has the city buzzing, which says something considering the success for the Browns that they're having. 
so that's very, very exciting. We're going to take a quick break and come back. We're going to do a segment called How Does This End? And then look at week two and week three game slates. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Books like Stephen King's The Shining or Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. If you're on the hunt for book recommendations and enjoy sparkling conversation, come read along with us and then listen in. Hey, the Roadman, Kenny Rota, join me and Dennis Maniloff on the Next Man Up podcast as we look at all the teams in the Buckeye State, the Browns, the Indians, the Cavaliers, the Buckeyes, and whatever's happening, you know we'll be talking about it here on the Next Man Up podcast. Hi, my name's Jeremy Powell, co-host of the Orange is Orange or Browns podcast. Check us out anywhere you listen to podcasts for all your Browns coverage, post-game, pre-game, anything you need, Browns, you'll find it here on the Orange is Orange or Browns podcast. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Aaron Scheip, co-host of the Tim and Scheip Show. We're part of the Press Play Podcast Network, and we love talking college football. We talk everything from Florida Gators to Ohio State Buckeyes. If you like college football, check us out. Thanks. Hey, it's JD from the Hyman Podcast. Using a narrative storytelling approach, the Hyman Podcast was created to start conversations, conversations that need to be human. Week by week, I'll break down walls and barriers and make people wildly uncomfortable, all the while giving a voice to the voiceless and the marginalized. Consider this your personal invitation to be part of that conversation. All right, we're back. Sam, let's do a segment that I like to call, How Does This End? I'm going to throw out um, a, a little phrase, and you tell me how this ends. It's pretty self-explanatory, okay? I think I can handle it. Yeah, go All ahead. right. The, the, the first phrase is this. This is kind of like overreactions are on point, but not so much. I just want to hear... Kind of like, I want you to look into your crystal ball and tell me, how does this end, Sam, the Cavs season? How does this end? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say I haven't looked at everybody else closely enough, but if they continue to play this way with good health, they will get into the playoffs, whether it's you know through a playoff play-in game or something like that. Um, I, th- I think they'll get maybe the eighth seed. I, I really Ooh, do. let's go. If they continue to play this way, they may get better than the eight seed. Ooh, Sam, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm all on board. I'm all in, man. Uh, that, that that's that's very, very exciting. Sam, how does this end Andre Drummond? It's a great question. You know, I, I wrote in my column tonight, uh, the dribbles column that you know if 48 minutes.com. Thank you. If the Cavs aren't uh, talking extension yet, then I don't know that they're not. But if they're not, they they might want to start get getting that ball rolling. Um, because if you don't come to that agreement, you know, some kind of contract extension, um, you will have to move them. And, and, and the way things are going, you don't even want to think about that. You know, you don't want to think about that, but it, you will have to think about that in March. Uh, if if you have not gotten to a contract extension. So if you're asking me how it will end, if things continue down this road, winning breeds good things. And if they decide they want to keep him, he's going to decide he'll want to stay because this is a young up and coming team. If that's the way it turns out to be, then I believe that he'll he'll sign a three or four year deal. All right, Sam, how does this end? I'm sure we're going to come back to this certain narrative numerous times over the next uh, couple months how does this end kevin love one of the last remnants of Cavs of yore <laughs> i think they're going to have such a difficult time trading him i mean chase i'm even talking about um you know getting some getting just some contracts back in the second round pick i i, I think that he's going to be here and they're going to have to at some point work with him to say, Kevin, we need you to come off the bench or, um, you know, maybe he starts, but he's not in at the end of games. And I'm not saying that's, that's for sure, but the way it's going right now, um, I just think it'd be too tough to trade him even, even for anything. And, um, and, and, you know, the hope is that he comes back around and plays, like the Kevin Love that that we know he's capable of playing like. Um, but I, I think he's going to be here till the end of his contract, unless 
unless some other team like the, the, the Miami Heat decide, you know what, we can get Kevin Love for basically nothing, so it's worth the, taking that chance. That's a possibility. But um, I, I, I just think right now it doesn't look great in terms of him being a productive player here um, and, and them getting to be able to get rid of him in, in, a, in a trade. So I think we're going to see a lot of the same with Kevin Love. You know, that seemed really, really depressing. <laughs> um, it, doesn't have to be. it doesn't have to be, you know, because he's a productive player. It's just how do you how do you use him? And, you know, he's not going to be an all star and that's OK. You just got to figure out how to use him if he's here. And um, sometimes older guys, this is just the way it goes. It's you're I don't want to say stuck with him because that does sound depressing. But um, you've got to find a way to u- utilize him. Uh, sporadically a little bit. Yeah. And, and Sam, I think you nailed it. Winning b- breeds great things. And I think the more successful the, the Cavs are, I think the more amount of energy and focus and buy-in Kevin, ha- Kevin will have. Um, and that makes him sound like a, not a really good team player. I don't think that's the case at all. I just think there's a certain energy and momentum and excitement you get when you're with. A... Okay. Here's an analogy. Uh, <laughs> My parents had a, an old white lab. All right. Great dog. He was great. They got a golden retriever puppy. And guess what happened to that white lab? He was like four or five years younger. He, he was a great white. He, he like had this life and energy and was wanting to play and wrestle and do these things again, go for walks. Right? right. And it wasn't that he, it was just, that's what happens when you get infused with this energy, young, fun talent. And, and, So I I think the best way to say how will this end with with Kevin is the Jersey and the rafters, right? That long-term is how this is going to end. I I truly believe he's, he's going to be in the rafters, Sam. Um, Yeah. If you were starter and an all-star in a championship team, you'll get your Jersey retired for sure. So I, I, I really think, if we keep winning, even if it's just 60% of our games, right? Even if we're around the 60% mark or 500, I think we're going to see a more engaged Kevin Love wanting to come back from injury and play and not just kind of like, I don't know. Um, so, uh, oceans, no, I, yeah, it, it, there's no chance of that. It's just how, how, uh, how well is he holding up physically and how well does yeah. he, this other, the, the other guys. Yeah. Even if he shows his disgust for me in the locker room, I'm still a K-Love fan. <laughs> I love his commitment to the team in the city. And uh, I don't know. I've, I've just, I've just been a fan. We wouldn't have a championship without him. And I, he played a huge role and it's a shame he got injured in 14, right? Was that the, is that the Olenek shoulder or is that fifth? That was 15. That was 15. Yeah. 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 15. Um, Cause I think we would have won that year if, if he was healthy and, and Kyrie was healthy. Um, so I, I, very big fan of uh, Kevin Love. All right, uh, last one, Sam. Um, how does this end, Colin Sexton and Darius Garland's relationship? Oh, I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I think it ends very well. I think that they, they, you know, the way what they've shown this year is that they, um, they they do have that kind of connection. Um, I don't know that, you know, they'll ever be great friends, but I mean, the fact that the two of them went out together and were shooting after a game, um, I think that 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 shows a little bit of bonding. A lot of times you see guys go out and do it individually. Um, They went out together. And uh, I I know that those two kind of feel like, yeah, everybody's doubting us because we're a smaller backcourt. Um, but they're, they're really starting. I, I, you can see that relationship growing, um, maturing and, um, them playing off of each other. So, uh, I, I think that they think that they could become something special together and maybe they're right. So, um, I, I, I foresee, you know, again, if the Cavs continue to not, not just win, but continue to play with this type of enthusiasm and confidence and belief uh, that they'll, they'll have a nice long uh, time together in the backcourt in Cleveland. This is my concern. The, uh, the alpha <laughs> dog kind of whose team is this? Um, Cause there can only, it's like Highlander. There can only be one. 
and teams yeah. that don't have that figured out in crunch time, you know, all it takes is one game where someone, you know, was out of step or, you know, didn't pass it or, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. For the team to recognize who the alpha is. I think it's, everyone knows it's Colin Sexton, I think. Um, yeah. But all it takes is one person at the wrong time to think otherwise. And then, and then, then the team has to make a choice. And th- that's, that's my concern. That would come with, with the wheels kind of coming off a little bit. Um, if you're winning again, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing that, that, that kind of stuff, unless you're like Shaq and Kobe or something, um, that kind of stuff doesn't creep in too often. And if it does, it's squashed pretty quickly because you win the next game and then you're happy again. Um, so again, you know, look, if, if, if you're Colin Sexton and Darius Garland, you can be one a and one B, um, you know, right now those guys look up to guys like love and Drummond so much that even still that it's not a big deal. And, and, and Drummond and the front court and, you know, even Larry Nance Jr., they love those guys. So right now it's, it's, it's all good. And if you just keep going down this road, and I know that Bickerstaff has played a role uh, in that too. And that, you know, but again, you start losing, you lose, you know, it's, you know, heaven forbid you lose six, seven in a row. Well, people are going to start pointing fingers. You, and, and you know what? That's human nature because you yeah. do that all- on the playground, right? You go out yeah. and you're playing even three on three or four on four and, and you start losing some games and you start getting annoyed with your teammates because, you know, they're obviously not. So as long as you can continue to, to put, you know, some tallies in the win column, um, it'll, it'll be smooth. If you don't, if you go the other way, then it's, it's going to get real rocky. So Agreed. it all depends on, you know, how, how much success you're having. And are you, are you living up to what the expectations are? You don't have to win a championship, but are you, are you a team that's fun and surprising, almost like last year's Oklahoma City Thunder? Yeah, and, and, they, and people thought that team loved each other, and this, yeah. this and too. You know, I think that's a good comp, and maybe the Suns as well. Um, yeah, but um, you know, all, all's good now because we're three and one, and you know, we're not zero and four or one and three. Um, but Sam, we're about to start a one, two, three, four, at least a five game uh, road kind of journey here over the next a couple of weeks, week two and week three. Uh, week two only has two games because of New Year's. Uh, we play again on Thursday, the 31st at Bankers Life Fieldhouse in Indiana against the Pacers at three. And then our week three slate, we see four away games, March, uh, Monday, January 4th. Uh, we have uh, two games actually in that uh center in that arena in Orlando against the magic uh, Monday and Wednesday, January 4th and 6th. And then on Thursday, January 7th, we're in Memphis play the Grizzlies at eight. And then Saturday, the ninth uh, we're in Milwaukee to play the bucks. Sam, what, uh, what would you like to see the Cavs kind of come, come out those next five games with um, kind of like, what would you see it be a successful road, road trip for them? Well, you know, and I could be wrong, Chase, but I think it's actually goes, there's another road game after that. Maybe you don't have the schedule up that far, but um, I think there if they might can, be, I, I stopped at week three. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was going to say if, if, if they can, you know, Indiana's going to be, Indiana just lost tonight. So they're, they're three and one also now. Um, they've been playing extremely well. That's going to be a tough go in and win. It's a great litmus test game right there. Like really how, yeah far yeah. have we come well, let's go against a really solid solid team and orlando um you get a split you don't want to get swept and that's that's tough because you're playing both games at their place but you know orlando is the team that you kind of want to be this year sure but what orlando was last year the way they you know they're they're kind of a a team without a true true super duper star and it's kind of um, pushing their way uh, to the uh, playoffs, you know, and, and, and if the Cavs are going to make the playoffs, it's a team like Orlando that, that they're going to have to be better than. So, yeah. um, well, really so- the, the next couple games, Sam, I mean, you have the, the Pacers, the magic and uh, I know the Grizzlies are in the, um, 
uh, almost said NFC. (laughs) (laughs) They're in the West, but um, Browns. I know it's I'm my brain's all about the Browns. We had a a huge game on Sunday, obviously, but uh, this this will tell us a lot about about the Cavs, Sam. These next five six games, uh, we will know by the middle of January what the season is going to be like. We, we see yeah. the potential now, but we really will see for the next five games what, what we have in store. Yeah, how much how much have they really grown uh, quickly? We'll see because uh, Orlando, uh, Indiana, or two against Orlando. Memphis won't have Morant. Um, right, 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 right. Go to their place. And then, you know, Milwaukee's going to get its act together here pretty quickly, I, I'm assuming. And they're a veteran team. Um but these are these are great, you know. If the Cavs just do what they did in the first four games, if they keep playing like they're playing now, it's going to be a blast to watch, and a blast to follow, and a blast to to see them grow. Which at the beginning of the year, Chase, I didn't think I'd be saying that at all this season. So I don't think uh, many people did. No. So this has been a nice little run for them, and they just got to keep playing like they're playing. And, and you know, JB Bickerstaff says this all the time keep giving this kind of effort and the chips are going to fall where they may, but more often than not, the ball's going to bounce your way when you're doing it like this. So I, 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 it's going to be real interesting. I'm, I'm anxious to see them play against uh, Indiana and how, how up with Indiana for starters. So, um, you know, wouldn't it be something if, wouldn't it be something if uh, Cleveland has the NFL coach of the year and the NBA coach of the year? Wouldn't that be something after all Cleveland's been through with their coaches? Yeah, well, that would be a nice start uh, <laughs> for the Browns. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think J.B. Bickerstaff, we, Doc Rivers talked about him the other night and said, this guy's one of the most underrated coaches in the NBA. Nobody talked about him, but look at the job he's done and not just these four games, but you go back to last season and those 11, yeah. uh, he's, he's done a fantastic job. The Cavs have looked like a different organization with him there. So uh, th- let's hope that the city of Cleveland has the NFL coach of the year, the NBA coach of the year, and the, the, the Cavs rider of the year, Sam Amico, right there. Uh, I'm, I'm gunning for you, buddy. <laughs> I would say that that's probably the least amount of odds happening, but um the trifecta, there it is. I'll give the great effort, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, well, that does it for this episode of Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Thank you all so much for downloading and listening. Seriously, we, we do this because we love talking Cavs, but we want to provide you with the very best analysis and content and talking head conversation that we can. Shouts to the Press Play Podcast Network for making this possible. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Cavs on the Break. We always follow back. You can follow Sam on Twitter um, at Amico Hoops. Is that still correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's, that's correct. And you can catch all of his work and writings at 48 minutes and outkick for all breaking news, insider info. Do not miss out. Sam, any final thoughts, brother? That's it. It's just, a, it's a, it's a um, much more exciting time to be a Cavs fan than, than I yeah. thought. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy for the fans and, and uh, I think it'll be, I think it'll be, there'll be a team worth watching through all 72 games. Sounds great, man. Looking forward to catching them and uh, let's see if they can surprise some more people, man. Mike Breen, take us out! Congratulations, Cleveland. Your decades-long wait is finally over. The Cavaliers are NBA champions.